Hello, my lovely, lovely people. It's me again. Welcome back to my living room studio here in beautiful downtown Taipei. Uh, the March public forum topic is out, and damn, I wish this was a two-month topic. Uh, we'll be talking about the U.S. Space Force. This topic is nicely simple compared to West Africa and the NSA, but simple is not the same thing as easy. But before I get into topic analysis, as always, a little bit of housekeeping first. Drop me an early like, please. It's good for the algorithm. Very healthy. Second, all the evidence that I cite in this video is at the Debate Track website in the Debate Track brief, available for free. DebateTrack.com. I'm not actually teaching this topic to any of my IRL classes, so the other material, Kahoot's game kit and whatnot, we're going to skip for this month. I think not a lot of you use it anyway, so I don't think it will be missed. Uh, but everything else, uh, this video, the evidence, and the uh, analytical rebuttals are for you guys in the debate track community, only for you. Uh, third, if you find this video helpful, please subscribe, and as usual, leave a comment. Uh, tell me about your favorite planet, or your favorite star, or your favorite space movie. Uh, Alright, let's begin, shall we? So, starting on the resolution, here we go. On balance, the benefits of creating the United States Space Force outweigh the harms. Now, this is a pretty simple uh, harms and benefits topic. Uh, nothing too confusing here. U.S. Space Force is a discrete organization, and we know exactly what it is. We'll talk about that presently. The only tricky word here is the word creating, and uh, I'm not going to talk about this much in the video at all. So there could be some good or bad things that happen simply because you created the Space Force. What I'm going to talk about in, the, in this video are the good and bad things about the Space Force. So what are the benefits and harms of the U.S. Space Force? Um, if I was going to redo this presentation, I would probably talk much more about this and also talk more about it, uh, do more research in the in the evidence. Hindsight is always 2020, right? Um, so there are some political ramifications, essentially, of creating the Space Force, maybe some uh, trade-offs with other legislation or some things that go along with the fact that Trump created it. Um, I'll briefly mention some things, but pretty much we're just talking about the harms and benefits of the U.S. Space Force, which is a big part of creating it, uh, but not everything. So a brief history of space. 1957, Russia, the USSR, launched the first satellite. Two years later, the U.S. tried to blow it up. They didn't actually target Sputnik, but they did demonstrate that they could use anti-satellite weapons. This was a missile that had a um, nuclear warhead, actually. The targeting wasn't so precise, so if you could blow up a nuclear warhead several miles away from target, that counted as an anti-satellite weapon. Uh, so, if you hear in this debate that Russia and China have been escalating tensions recently, you can remember that the U.S. took all of two years in the 50s uh, to develop an anti-satellite uh, missile after the first uh, satellite was launched. 82, U.S. Air Force Space Command is launched. In uh, 85, the U.S. Space Command, separate from the Air Force Space Command, was um, launched. It was then disbanded and reformed again in 2019. So talking about U.S. Space Command, what does that mean? You are familiar, of course, with the organization of the U.S. military in terms of Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, and now Space Force. But there's a different structure uh, across which the military is organized and it deals with the region that these forces are operating in so uh whether it's the african command or the uh, european command or the northern command uh, these are different regions in the world where uh the military can operate and space is one of those areas so the u.s space command deals with that area of space but could use the resources of you know navy air force space force space force is the actual group of uh, soldiers or technicians who will be um, executing whatever the space command needs them to do. Uh, so shortly afterwards, in December uh, 2019, the U.S. Space Force was founded, so they've just celebrated their first birthday. Happy birthday, Space Force. And uh, a few months ago, August 2020, the Space Power Doctrine was released. This is the Space Force's um, guide for what exactly are they supposed to do, what is their place in the world, and we'll talk about that presently. In terms of recent escalations, 20, um, 2007, 
China launched an anti-satellite missile at one of its own satellites, blew it up, just demonstrated that, hey, uh, China's on the scene, we can blow up your satellites now. 2019 and 20, Russia had a number of anti-satellite tests. The most interesting of this was a co-orbital test where instead of having a Earth-based missile launched at a, a satellite, instead Russia launched uh, a projectile from a miss from a satellite to another satellite. So this is a satellite that can take down a co-orbiting satellite, another satellite. Um, India also has had a test fairly recently, um, but Russia and China are more interesting because they are our enemy. So these are really the three countries that are super relevant for the topic. The U.S. obviously U.S. Uh, Space Force, China, and Russia, our enemies. These are not coincidentally the number one, number two, a uh, number three country for uh, the numbers of satellites in space. So the U.S. has 1,400 plus, China 380 plus, Russia 170 plus. Um, all of them have um, anti-satellite weapons, but the U.S. is number one in terms of the number and uh, sophistication of weapons. India, Japan, and the U.K., also have some space programs and and space weapons most prominently india who has uh, tested it recently uh, these countries are less interesting because uh, they are distant fourth fifth and sixth places in terms of um, how many satellites they have in space but more importantly they're allies of the u.s so there could be connections between india japan uk and this topic but uh the ones between the u.s and our uh, enemies, China and Russia, are more obvious. This is uh, a running count of how many satellites each country has in 2018. You'll note the staggering difference between 2018 and two years later, 2020, when the U.S. has almost doubled the amount of satellites. This speaks to the rapid acceleration in the proliferation of satellites in outer space like um countries are launching many 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 more satellites and particularly the u.s but not just the u.s and a lot of this is because satellites are getting smaller and cheaper we'll talk about cubesats in a bit but let's talk about um the space power doctrine so this is the uh guiding principles for the u.s space force um this is my sort of summary my paraphrasing of these five principles don't take this as gospel. So first, the goal of the Space Force is to um, make a peaceful and secure and accessible space domain. So make sure that there's uh, no hostile or kinetic actions in space. The same way that we can pretty much trust that an airplane that you're riding in isn't going to get shot down, that a uh, uh, merchant ship traveling across the oceans isn't going to be uh, taken over by pirates. We can pretty much trust these things thanks to international order. The U.S. wants to establish the same thing in space. Uh, why is that important? Well, number two, the value of space is the reach, persistence, endurance, uh, and overflight, meaning that once you put a satellite up into space, it can uh, almost indefinitely uh, remain there and monitor or do whatever mission it has to do um, for just about ever, for decades, right? It's illegal to fly over countries without their permission in an airplane. It's not illegal to do it in space. So there's legal overflight across the entire world. Uh, even if China doesn't want you flying over their country, it doesn't matter. You can put a satellite over their country. Third mission is to protect, defend, and project this space power. So that's the goal of the U.S. Space Force is to project space power, uh, which sounds super cool. Uh, the scope would be in space, on the ground, and between the space and the ground. So in space, assets would be satellites. Uh, terrestrial or Earth-based would be satellite dishes or whatever. I don't really know much about uh, technology, but whatever is interfacing with satellites on Earth. Um, and also the link between space and Earth assets, and that would mostly be in the cyber domain, uh, I assume. And how is the Space Force going to um, uh, access these goals and this mission is through having small and adaptable teams that are focused on agility, innovation, and boldness. So a key a key guiding principle of the Space Force is that it should remain small and agile uh, as compared to the other branches, which are can be large and unwieldy. A big part of why the Space Force was founded in the first place is because some critics thought that the 
Air Force, for example, couldn't adequately handle uh, the duties of space given how fast everything is changing. If you want to see, by the way, uh, the entire guide, you can find it at tiny.cc slash space power. I tried to link directly to this 40-page uh, guide, uh, but I was blocked for some reason. So if you download it now from uh, my Google Drive, using this link, maybe you'll get arrested and thrown in jail, and maybe I'll also get arrested and thrown in jail. So, uh, fun stuff. All right, let's look at some space weapons as they exist. Uh, I've listed four of them. This is certainly not everything, but I think it's the four that seem the most likely. First, cyber attacks, far and away the most likely way that you're going to attack a uh, satellite. So cyber attacks, they're cheap, they're accessible, even countries obviously like North Korea and Iran, which aren't the richest countries in the world, can field um, enormously complex and um, sophisticated and effective cyber attacks for cheap. So why would you do anything else? Uh, cyber attacks can also be executed with near impunity. So if Russia bombed the U.S., or if we found that Russia had... Uh, 10,000 spies throughout the U.S. that we discovered at the same time, uh, the consequences would be severe and perhaps existential. But Russia can hack into 50,000 computers, uh, computer systems in the U.S., and they've pretty much just gotten away with it, right? This happened last December, obviously. So cyber attacks are the the most logical tool for you to take out any kind of uh, system that can be accessed uh, in an enemy. However, uh, missiles, once again, have been tested by the U.S., Russia, China, and India. Uh, there are no other countries, as far as I know, who have launched anti-satellite weapons. I could be wrong. Uh, lasers are interesting. So these would be Earth-based weapons that can be used to blind uh, the sensors on satellites. So if you have something you don't want a satellite to take pictures of, you can plant a laser next to it and shine it on any uh, overhead satellite that could be potentially monitoring it and temporarily or in some cases permanently blind the sensors using these lasers. Last cool orbital weapons, I put this only on the list because Russia has indeed tested one of them recently. So uh, if Russia wasn't intending to use it, why would it be there? So core orbital weapons, satellite to satellite weapon could be a potential. The illustration is a little bit sci-fi-y. Let's break it down. So the laser that you see in the illustration, most likely these lasers would actually come from Earth. Uh, the missiles are missiles, fine. Molten metal cannon, cannon fire. I've seen nothing about how uh, this could be put into place in the, in the space domain, but it is a very interesting and terrifying weapon that DARPA is um, developing. Uh, I do not believe it's in use yet. The rods from God, these are not uh, anti-satellite weapons. These would be satellite to Earth weapons so something launched from a sat some kind of missile launch from a satellite to earth uh that could presumably hit its target quicker than let's say uh intercontinental ballistic missile so these are the main weapons we'll be uh looking at in this topic so here's a brief history of what uh has been going on in space the capabilities of other country countries um and what the space force wants to do exactly and the space weapons that we'll be up against or in fact using. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see some aspects of the Space Force that have reached sort of meme status. So the logos on the left, the Space Force logo, on the right, the Star Trek uh, Federation of Planets logo. Uh, the Space Force claims they're not related. Everyone else wonders. Uh, and the uniform, why do you need camouflage in space? All right, let's move on, shall we? Uh, so satellite services, this is really the heart of the topic, right? When we talk about what's happening in space, we're talking about satellites. So uh, attacking or defending uh, uh, space assets that just involve satellites. There's three different places, and they're not so discrete. Obviously, there's a lot of middle ground that satellites can be in, either low orbit, mid orbit, or high orbit, just depending on how high above the Earth they are. So starting with uh, high orbit satellites, uh, telescopes and sun monitoring, these are mostly scientific um, uh, scientific satellites. These would not be targeted likely because number one, they're scientific, they're not uh, military use. So if uh, an enemy country wanted to attack us, why would they attack our science? Uh, and second, they're very, really, really far away. Some are like really, really, like really, really far away, like somewhere be half the distance between the earth and the sun. It's impossibly high up and we would never 
you'd, you'd never be able to use uh, any kind of a missile in order to hit these satellites. Mid-orbit ones are a little bit more interesting. These would also be very, depending on where they are, very, very difficult to reach with some kind of a missile or an anti-satellite weapon. Uh, but some of some crucial um, technologies are housed in these mid-orbit satellites, like navigation, GPS, and communication. These are really, navigation and communication are, are really most of the bulk of what the military uses the satellites for. Many, many other things as well, but but the, these would be the most important. And of course, what people, uh, civilians use use satellites for on on Earth. However, even mid-orbit satellites are going to be very, very difficult to hit with uh, these missiles that we've talked about or other weapons. Low-orbit satellites are the most relevant because number one, you can actually hit them with these missiles, and number two, they're uh, it's where most satellites are actually at. So here are some examples of what's in low orbit, the space station, CubeSats, we'll talk about that in a second, weather satellite, satellites, imaging satellites, communication satellites, for both military and non-military uses. This is where the vast majority of satellites takes place. Um, satellites do travel very quickly, uh, some thousands of kilometers per hour, some upwards of 10,000 kilometers per hour in space, and uh, so, needless to say, in order to hit one with a missile, it takes a huge amount of technological uh, know-how. What kind of satellite uh, services do satellites provide? Let's look a in a little bit more detail. Uh, your phone won't work, GPS won't work, TV won't work without satellites. All of these things rely on satellites. Um, international banking, so credit cards, ATM services, in order to authenticate um transactions they use uh, satellites it's much quicker uh, video conferencing obviously any kind of weather climate monitoring search and rescue the search part happens through satellites um, land and water management and any kind of natural resource management including uh, wildlife management um, anything related to uh, climate change monitoring all takes place with satellites so this list probably won't blow your mind not so shocking but um just helpful to keep this in mind if satellites all disappeared overnight would you die no not likely not immediately uh but your life would be radically altered and uh given the sort of tendrils that this technology reaches into uh many 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 people would die in the end right you you think you you would immediately shut down most supply chains without satellites so shut down most communication uh shut down the internet so satellites needless to say are important let's talk about cubesats because they're interesting so they're just tiny satellites that's all they are uh, they're also cheap so 150,000 would be like the very very low end fifty thousand dollars for the 10 by 10 satellite um it could be several of them so the ones that you see in the picture are like groups of three uh 10 by 10 centimeter satellites fifty thousand dollars for the satellite itself a hundred thousand for launches at the very 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 low end but tiny price compared to the millions tens hundreds of millions of dollars that a lot of more complex satellites are so this means that many countries have been able to launch their first ever satellites 2019 2020 and just in past years uh, many countries have launched their first ever satellite because of the low cost they've been able to get something that can for example uh take pictures of their country or help with communications on their country obviously their tech the capabilities are limited because they are tiny but what gets really interesting is uh, when you get hundreds of them together, um, several companies have been trying this technology to make uh, constellations of cube satellites uh, to provide internet access all over the world. So SpaceX is doing this the most seriously, but Amazon is also a contender. Other companies have tried. Uh, there's been some talk about Facebook doing it, but SpaceX and Amazon are the most serious uh, companies that are actually trying to make this a reality make uh, a worldwide internet beam down from low earth orbit satellites a reality this also solves interestingly uh internet censorship ship so if you're in uh, north korea or china and the government limits what you can uh access online these internet constellations would solve that issue right you get internet directly beamed down from space the government has no say in what you can access this also connects to SpaceX funding for Mars missions. So SpaceX wants to uh, form a colony on Mars, send people there, and they need a lot of money to do that. Obviously, very, very expensive. 
one of the ways they're planning to do this is using the money from space or from these internet constellation satellite uh, services. So you pay for you pay SpaceX for the internet from the little satellites. They use the money to get to Mars. So kind of a cool aside. Let's talk about U.S. military satellites. Once again, this shouldn't blow your mind, but is important because that's what we're talking about, right? U.S. Uh, space forces from the U.S. military. So U.S. military uses satellites for three things, Intel, navigation, and comms. Intel, anytime you want to take a picture of something, see where something's moving. It doesn't have to be like uh, normal images. You could use, uh, for example, infrared, and this can help to sense uh, missile launches, nuclear explosions anywhere in the world, and, and other kinds of imaging. Uh, the bottom picture, you see an image taken of uh, Osama bin Laden's compound from a satellite. And this is a very, very normal part of uh, military operations. Navigation, obviously, any convoy, any ship, any plane uses satellites for navigation. But uh, mi smart bombs and missiles also use GPS for navigation. Drones use uh, GPS for navigation. These all rely on satellites. Communications, anytime you want to talk. Uh, I mean, we, us, use satellites for our phone. The military is no different, um, although presumably they have more dedicated, secure communication lines. Uh, but they can also be used for signal intelligence, for eavesdropping, to listen to other countries' communications. So these functions, intel, navigation, and comms, are shared by all branches of the military, right? Once again, the Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Coast Guard all use satellites for these uh, missions. This, are, this is not something that's specific to the new U.S. Uh, Space Force. It, it goes across all branches of the military, which means that if any of these were disabled, it would hurt the capabilities of all branches of the military. Um, using uh, satellites is a big part of what sets the U.S. military apart. Uh, there's a concept, the fog of war, meaning if you're fighting a war on the ground, no one has any idea what's going on because it's just too confusing and chaotic and uh, you don't really know what happens in a battle until afterwards. You can kind of analyze it afterwards. And this is just how battles have been throughout all of history. Uh, until satellites came along, and now we know exactly what's going on. Well, at least the U.S. military does, but a lot of our enemies don't. And that's why uh, U.S. military rocks a big uh, part of it. So that's the deal with satellites. Once again, the heart of the issue. Uh, different orbits of the satellites, services they offer. Uh, the interesting side note of CubeSats, and then U.S. military satellites and how they work. All right, let's move on to arguments themselves. So the pro side is super gung ho about the military. I'm sorry about the uh, about space, about the space domain, and also about the military, and also believes that the military can uh, really be helped by this uh, space force. So the U.S. is dominant in space, but given, for example, recent tests and uh, satellite launches. Russia and China are challenging the U.S.'s claim to the throne. Uh, if they can do that, they can also perhaps control commerce in the same way that China is controlling the commerce in the uh, South China Sea, uh, or threaten U.S. Uh, assets the same way that Russia has maybe threatened uh, NATO countries with uh, positioning military troops, equipment, and such. So the U.S. Space Force will be a key focus on making sure that these countries don't get ahead and uh, challenge the status quo. So uh, the U.S. once again enjoys right now military superiority in space, but having this strong space presence offers some benefits. So right now, military satellites are mostly large and very expensive. Uh, once again, hundreds of millions, some upwards of a billion dollars for a single satellite. Uh, so the Space Force will move our space capabilities closer to this internet constellation model, many smaller, cheaper satellites, so that if some were taken offline or destroyed, it wouldn't take out the capabilities of our space presence. We would have some uh, resilience to attacks by enemies, and especially uh, from, once again, Russia and China. Uh, this trope is getting old. We need some new enemies. In addition, uh, there's economic security that's guaranteed that could be guaranteed by the Space Force. So if we keep space uh, safe, we keep the economy open, have, maintain, let's say, freedom of use, freedom of uh, flight in space, we won't f f uh, face any kind of shutdown. The space economy is very big, 400 billion worldwide. Uh, U.S. 
a space for budget itself for acquisitions according to Irwin 20 is 12 uh, billion I'm not sure exactly but I believe I believe most of this is uh, acquisition that will be used uh, to work with the private sector in in developing and acquiring uh, uh, materials uh, satellites and weapons and whatnot for the Space Force so uh, really big economy uh, you can think of this sort of like the way once again that um, ships can navigate the open waters of the ocean relatively unharmed and a big part of that is because we have uh, global uh, security on the oceans right like uh, you there's there's free and open trade on the oceans there's freedom of navigation to sail on international waters and that means that there's a lot of in, uh, economic security that the our, our uh, trade networks around the world work well right so the u.s space force wants the same thing in outer space uh, in addition of course to uh, having the military benefits once again the those satellites are important for the entire u.s military we would be blind and deaf without them other arguments for pro, I think extinction scenarios could be very interesting. So satellites relate to uh, early detection and of uh, missiles and detection of any kind of nuclear explosion. So if our satellites were taken offline, nuclear war could be more likely. And as the fog of war increases in a situation like a missile exchange, uh, the more likely it might be for the U.S., for example, to launch a missile because it doesn't know what's going on, right? If there's missiles coming in and they might be nuclear, as we know from nuclear strategy, we probably have to launch some ICBMs back. So uh, protecting these assets is vital to avoid nuclear war. Once again, uh, many of the satellites are used for uh, weather monitoring and specifically for climate change modeling and so if any satellites were disabled our ability to keep track of climate change could also be taken off offline lopez 20 talks about the space force potentially stopping asteroids uh low probability occurrence but obviously high magnitude an asteroid killed the dinosaurs why could it not kill us and last as i mentioned before uh some of the satellites spacex will use as a revenue source to colonize mars and this could uh, at least in theory, help to avoid human extinction. So I think if you combine several of these extinction scenarios uh, for the pro side, that could that could be a decent case by itself. All right. Lastly, uh, the con team will wonder. Fine, this is all well and good. Why do we need the space force though? Why can we not use the U.S. Air Force or other military assets or the international community or or uh, the UN to provide these kind of benefits, right? And also, like, who's actually challenging? Uh, who's actually challenging the U.S. military? Who's challenging these commercial sectors? Well, here's some uh, benefits that the U.S. Space Force uniquely provides. First, threat identification. So we want to know if there's, for example, a missile launch or an attack in space. Where did it come from? Uh, who did it? And we want to know that ASAP. And that's something that we have a hard time doing. So threat ID is one thing that the uh, Space Force uniquely will be focused on. Second, resilience, as I've mentioned, our current, uh, the military, the U.S. military's current space infrastructure is prone to, uh, it's, it would be easy to attack. So it's not as resilient as it should be. You could take out a number of key satellites, like as little as six, and bring down our uh, capabilities for navigation, for example so having so building out a more uh resilient space infrastructure is one of the space force's goals lastly and maybe more importantly is just alignment of the space forces towards how important space is as a domain so without the space force uh the domain of space could seem secondary to much of the armed forces but aligning the entire mission of the u.s military with the understanding that space is a extremely and increasingly important as a, a war fighting domain is uh, something that the space force can uniquely do that other domains cannot all right so th those are the pro arguments space force um, is awesome. We need to maintain military superiority. It can potentially stop some kind of extinction scenarios, and there are some unique benefits that the Space Force can offer. Uh, the uniqueness arguments I've given are 
honestly not great. So I would uh, perhaps focus on this if you're going to do some more research. I'm also coming up right on 30 minutes of the recording, and I don't remember if I can do more than 30 minutes. So I'm going to try to go into con, and we'll cross our fingers and hope for the best. Let's go con. All right. So um, the con side doesn't disagree that space is important. They don't disagree that uh, the satellites are important. They don't disagree that they need to be protected. They con the con side should probably also acknowledge, like, yes, maybe we have some vulnerabilities in space. Yes, we need to build out our capabilities. Uh, yes, we have vulnerabilities that need addressing. Yes, the status quo is uh, maybe not okay. But look, space force is not the way to do it. Space force um, is the wrong way to go about fixing whatever problems we may have. Um, in addition, so so the two big reasons, number one, uh, there's a lot of unique disadvantages to the um, Space Force. This is agency disads, that bubble, uh, and space debris as well. But there, uh, uh, but the, hmm. But it also offers no benefits. So the Air Force Space Command that existed before the Space Force could have done all of the things that the pro team is um, looking to do by it uh, by itself. We didn't need to establish the Space Force in order to gain almost all of the benefits of the pro side. Uh, so if the pro side is just saying that, once again, that satellites are important or that the military uh, like should focus on space more, like Khan can be like, yes, 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 we agree with all of these things. Why do we need the Space Force to do it? We don't. So one of the big, let's say, disadvantages is that creating a space force will create an arms race. Now, China, uh, once again, had an anti-satellite test in 2007. India had one in 2019, and it's very likely that this was in response to China's test. Although, obviously, much later, uh, India needed to show China that it had the same capabilities as China. And so this is one example of how, how an arms race can get going in terms of militarization. If we want to protect our assets in space, we don't need a um, space force to do it. And we certainly don't need more weapons. So any benefits that the pro side is saying about weapons uh, in space, note that these weapons don't actually help your, uh, your satellites at all. Uh, if you have missiles, uh, anti-satellite missiles, it could provide some level of deterrence. But if somebody wants to shoot down your missiles, they can do it uh, through any of the weapons that we've talked about, missiles or uh, cyber attacks or whatever else. Uh, us having more weapons doesn't help. Next, uh, and if you want something really theoretical for Khan, this is where I might look, is that the the concept of militarizing space at all is uh, disgusting. Like w We are a violent uh, creature, human beings, and to be able to like transcend this this violence and transcend the, our animal nature uh, as humanity, we should be aiming towards uh, coming together to explore and maybe colonize space, but but to leave behind our violent tendencies. And the Space Force is a definite step in exactly the wrong direction. This is, yeah, Robson 20. I don't think he says all that, but he or she says all that, but uh, lastly, diplomacy. So if we want to tell China or Russia to like calm down, to stop militarizing, to stop building space weapons, we can't say that anymore. Like we have lost all credibility in, uh, in, we have lost all credibility in telling other countries what to do and what not to do in terms of space warfare or weapons, because we now have a space force. It's obvious that we're concentrating now on fighting wars in space and we can't back down from that with a space force. Uh, oh, this alternative is we should work on diplomacy. So once again, uh, the weapons don't work. So what are we doing with the Space Force? We should uh, focus on diplomacy and arms control agreements instead of standing up a Space Force, which is concentrating on fighting war in space. Wrong direction. Militarization is bad. Uh, one of the big disadvantages of militarization uh, links into space debris. So space debris, just any uh, big or small piece of trash floating in space. Many of these are made of metal. Much of it is like old satellites that are now defunct, just stuff we've thrown up in space, or pieces of those satellites. Uh, there's millions of pieces of mostly yeah metal in other parts of like old satellites up in space. And as you can see from the second picture, like even a very, very small piece can bring a huge amount of damage. So we're tracking all of the big pieces, like softball sized and above. Uh, of these space debris, we have most of most of these tracked now. 
so if you have a satellite you can try to like avoid them obviously like the space station has people on it so the space station needs to avoid all of these little pieces but there's many other pieces that we have no idea where they are uh, they're just too small for us to track so i mean imagine like if someone throws a penny at you it's not gonna hurt probably because it's a penny right but uh if someone shoots a penny at you at 2000 kilometers an hour you're you'll explode and uh same thing happens in space once again these pieces of debris are traveling at uh several thousands of kilometers an hour some in excess once again of 10,000 kilometers an hour uh, so a small piece can do a great amount of damage uh, 2007 chinese anti-missile test uh created a huge amount of space debris that we have to keep track of to this day that's what the bottom illustration shows dramatized obviously a little bit it's not like we can't use any of this space but that's like the range that the um debris from their anti-satellite test um hit the later india test by the way intentional was intentionally done in like kind of a downward direction with a lower orbiting satellite in order to not create more space debris while still showing that they could shoot down satellites uh, masher 19 talks about the kessler syndrome this is hypothetical but possible uh situation uh uh chain reaction of space debris imagine like a small piece of debris hits a satellite breaking it into 100 pieces each of those 100 pieces becomes uh, another tiny bullet that can travel off and destroy more satellites breaking them into more tiny pieces and like before you know it space or some regions of space are not usable anymore so this could hurt uh, satellite services once again rendering them um, totally or partially unusable for hundreds or thousands of years that's all in Mosher 19 uh, so pro will have some kind of defense against space debris that uh, we have technical ways we can fix it we can use nets or magnets or different collecting devices but none of these have actually been demonstrated to be used they're all pretty much hypothetical and uh they don't work so if pro uh, has some technology solution that they're dreaming up that's like cute but they're not operational so uh that can't actually help and so if these satellite services are are disabled or destroyed by space debris this will hurt all of the things that satellites do of course and some of these things are uh, tracking like human rights violations taking pictures of xinjiang right um uh, aviation weather telecom financial and anything else any kind of comms or gps services uh, could be hurt uh what else oh yeah so if we're militarizing space of course we're doing it to use space warfare space weapons and so especially given the prevalence of recent like space missile launches like you militarizing space means you're going to create more debris that's that's inevitable all right uh lastly the reasons why not militarizing space is bad by but specifically why the space force is bad uh so first it costs a lot more uh, if we just uh continued using our existing services especially from the air force we would have a lower cost and this is, this is an additional cost of three billion dollars plus 1.3 billion dollars a year uh for the space force once again uh arms control we have no credibility in terms of arm control arms control agreements because oh we now have a space force right if we didn't break the status quo by establishing the space force a year ago and just kept our like uh, navy and air force uh space operations uh we would have more wiggle room more negotiating room in negotiating arms control agreements with other countries uh, the air force space command was totally able to do what they needed to do uh there was no real issues with it um in fact it's a little bit better to have uh integration to have space professionals across the different branches of the military because once again each branch of the military necessarily depends on the space force or on uh, space services so this is not like secondary to any part of the military uh we need space professionals across the military what the space force does is take all of those professionals out put them in one place suddenly we have this massive wall of bureaucracy which has less integration between the forces and therefore will decrease effectiveness these can be very powerful standard arguments O'Hanlon 19 thompson 18 these are two sources but there are uh many more i think having at least one contention about uh just some of these agency disadvantages uh, could be really good for con it could actually be the whole con case or at least one of your contentions can just be like um yeah air force does it better all right um that took 
longer than I hoped for, but it was pretty fun. Let's look at a couple of the little resources. So, of course, uh, follow Debate Track on YouTube and Instagram, and maybe Clubhouse soon if I can get an invite. Somebody send me a Clubhouse invite, please. Uh, recommended reading. Oh, no, recommended TikToks. Uh, debate Track, of course. Uh, but also this one above, like, actually, like, write that down if you're in class. Pull out your phone. Pull it out. Uh, this is like a just a hilarious guy who makes uh, like uh, military TikToks, but his videos are like kind of like inappropriate for kids, so I can't like uh, put it in the YouTube video. But uh, you can TikTok it. It's funny. Maybe not your style of humor. I think it's funny. It has a lot of Space Force references and recommended reading. Uh, so one. This was the best article I could find just about like general space backgrounds, terminology, concepts. This will be really helpful. If this is your first space concept or your first space um, topic, or if any of what I'm of what I'm talking about is like confusing, if you're like, what what is all of this? You know, if I skipped over some things that aren't obvious to you, read this. Um, and then, uh, because we're talking about the Space Force, you should read this essay from the head of the Space Force uh, at this link right here. Uh, yeah, obviously this is pro Space Force, but it gives you a really good idea of like, what are they doing? Um, what are they up to? What are the advantages? Why is it good? And that's it. Yeah. Um, lastly, thank you guys so much for watching these videos. I really, really, really love your comments. Like some of your, your comments that you send me or make it right on the YouTube, they like make my day. I'm not really a crier, but if I cried, some of them would definitely make me cry. It's like uh, emotional. That's what I say. Like I really, really love doing this. So, thank you for 300 subscribers. Uh, thank you for everyone who watches these. Uh, thank you for all of the comments. Like I love doing this. I love doing this, and I love you guys. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, good luck in your tournaments. Have fun. And uh, oh, lastly, just send me a message with uh, anything you think I can improve about these videos, about the evidence, about anything. Uh, you'd like to see maybe you're consuming this content, but there's some like glaring issue Tell me tell me what it is like I'm making this for you. So Tell me what you need if anything uh, peace and love. Bye. Bye guys